I was wondering if there's any science behind the claim that fitness comes back quickly. To me, that would imply that consistent training produces at least some semi-permanent adaptations. But is there any merit to this? Or is it something we tell ourselves to feel better about our massive fitness drop after a training break, asking for a friend? Surely you are, Yari, and a very concerned friend. Way to go. Um, so yeah, Chad, uh, what say you on this point? Okay, so first off, I just have to point out the use of the term semi-permanent. And I see that, and we all know what it means, but I struggle with it because it's like being 99% uh, sure. You know, you're, you're sure or you're not sure there's yeah. it's, it's black or white binary same with permanent it's permanent or it's not yeah, yeah there's exactly. no middle ground. but Very i get good it point, we're, we're yeah. talking about we're talking about changes that hang in there for longer they don't dissipate super quickly yeah. okay so th this comes down to or, or the differentiation here i guess could be the drawn between reduction in training versus cessation of training. And we just talked about reduction. We'll touch back on it in a little bit, but for now, let's steer the conversation towards cessation. And I'm going to look at an observational study to kick things off by Maldonado and uh, Maldonado Martin combination name or hyphenated name a few years back who used young, what she termed, I believe top level athletes, and they underwent five weeks of training cessation. And the reason this isn't an interventional study, but an observational one is because they did this anyway. They didn't have to say, take five weeks off. Rather, these athletes were at the end of their season and they were going to take five weeks off. So they just watched them and saw what happened. In this case, <clears throat> they were all men, 10 of them. They were roughly 20 years of age. And these were hitters, youngsters with big aerobic engines in the VO2 max in the ballpark of 80. So oh, highly, nice. highly capable <laughs> training, <laughs> <laughs> training in the ballpark of 20 hours a week. All of them were right around five Watts a kilo, uh, on the bike for about 25,000 kilometers per year if that resonates with you and competing on the order of about 50 days per year. So in other words, they so, just grabbed 50 random Nike athletes. Cause I swear they're yeah, all, seriously. it's ridiculous For real. <laughs> how fast they climb yeah. those kids. Yeah. So if we go back to Mujica and Padilla again, they noted in their short-term study that VO2 max over the course of about four weeks declines anywhere from six to 20% when you stop training. And this study totally held that up because they went for five weeks and they saw a decline between eight and 11%. And it's worth noting that this is similar across endurance sports. It doesn't matter whether you're a kayaker or a swimmer or a cross-country skier, this, this, this just carries. And this is largely attributable in, in early stages to a decrease in blood volume and therefore the delivery to the working muscles. So plasma changes happen fast. Red blood cell content over the course or red blood cell count over the course of this declines. So your, your, your pack cell volume comes down and with it, hemoglobin levels. So, so you know, hmm. we got the less red blood cells to carry the oxygen to the working muscles, less hemoglobin on those red blood cells to bind the oxygen and get into the muscles. So this is why you take that big VO2 max hit early on. And that in and of itself is, is a bummer. But what I find to be the more crushing declines happen at the submaximal values. And that's basically LT1, LT2. And, and this takes place up to in the ballpark of 20% with both of them. So let's briefly talk about what those mean. We've talked about the ventilatory thresholds when, when Nate can get it out of his mouth, the VT1 and VT2. <laughs> this is this is closely equivalent. Good job. I hope he's still in the live <laughs> chat. Jab, Nate. He, there we go. He knows it. He knows it. He struggles with that word. <laughs> So VT1 and VT2. We had to jab him once. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. I, yeah. I lowered myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So VT1 and VT2, close, close correlates to LT1 and LT2. And, and we just, we kind of deal more in that, that realm here, here at Trainer Road and probably as coaches in general. I, I don't know. But uh, so LT2 is pretty straightforward. We, 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 we work in terms of FTP. And there's also the term maximal lactate steady state. There's a hundred other terms, but this is kind of, kind of for most people is about four millimoles of lactate in the bloodstream at any one point, but that's highly variable. Uh, they, if one study said that if they pin the average at four millimoles, then athletes range anywhere from two to seven millimoles at a time. So it's a pretty big oh, wow. variance, but most people tend to fall oh, yeah. around four millimoles. I don't even know if anybody really uses that anymore. They may say what happens at four millimoles, but they don't define that as your max, max last state. Okay. So, so basically FTP LT one, however, or VT one, I, I think people don't recognize the importance of this. And I kind of touched on it above when I talked about the difference between aerobic endurance and muscular endurance. This is maybe 60, 65, 70% of your FTP, but this is where you live if you're doing long events. If you're doing anything over a few hours, you're gonna spend so much time here. And you may not think 
it doesn't matter where my LT1 falls. And, and in terms of blood lactate, that's basically a one minimal bump from inactivity. So you're sitting there, you start doing a bit of work, your blood lactate comes up a little bit, but it's highly tolerable, something you can do for long periods of time. But again, this is where you live. So if your LT1 falls at 200 watts and people are riding at 220, that's going to put you in a, that, that, that's going to be a limitation. But if you elevate your LT1 to 240, and now you're working highly aerobically at wattage that's above what the field is traveling at, that bodes well for you. So it's not just about FTP. I mean, that aerobic endurance down at 60 to 70% of your FTP is really important. And elevating that, depending on the type of athlete you are and the goals you have, is really important, or it can be. Mm. Okay, so back to the study with the youngsters. The, the body mass effects, I haven't even talked about those yet. So these affect everything on all, affect all of the relative values. And these poor kids gained Thank anywhere- God, the truth. The, the upper end of it was a 5%, roughly a 5% gain in body mass. And you can bet that probably wasn't muscle because kids that are this fast are probably not hitting the gym trying to add mass. This is probably just, and they were detraining anyway. So I'm guessing they weren't in the gym at all. That means they were coming back into their training season. If they were at 70 kilograms and that, that was the, the median for these guys with an extra three and a half kilograms of body mass, which I'm going to guess is adipose tissue, which translates to about eight pounds in standard measures. That's a, that's just discouraging. I mean, coming back in with that much extra mass on your body, that's a bummer. That does not motivate hard training from, from the get-go. You know what though, Chad is as hard as that would be. That's honestly not far out of the realm of, of actual that, that regularly occurs for a lot of athletes when they go Absolutely. into an off season every oh, no, year. No, that, that's so where I'm going applicable. with this. So yeah, I feel like this yeah, let, was watching me eight weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to cut to yeah. the chase here. Don't do any of this. Don't take five weeks out. Okay. Sure. So these are all decreases that were observed in younger athletes, and it is different for older professionals. We typically see lesser drops in both submaximal and maximal exercise responses. And this carries to amateur athletes too. And we'll talk about that a little more. So let's put these declines in power terms for just a minute. And this isn't the best example because it's a, a rower and it's at the elite level, but it does help us put some power numbers behind what's at stake here. This study was a, a case study on an elite rower where for eight weeks, this athlete detrained over the course of that eight weeks, this, uh, this athlete, I think it was a man, this guy saw an 8% decline actually with these numbers, it was a man the, saw an 8% decline in VO2 max. Okay. That, that, that sounds terrible. I don't, I don't want that. What does that translate <laughs> to? Well, the power that this athlete was putting out at VO2 max was 546 Watts. And given we're talking about rowing, so there's a whole lot of muscle mass contributing more so than driving the pedals that declined from 546 to 435 Watts. That's a 20% hit in the power at that now lower VO2 max. I mean, that's, mm. that's tremendously discouraging. So eight weeks of inactivity, 20% drop, eight weeks of retraining rekindled about 15% of that brought it up to 501. So what was about 550 is now about 500 after eight weeks. 12 more weeks for a total of 20 weeks of retraining back up to snuff, 552 watts. Point being that it took 20 weeks just to get back to where this athlete was, which I mean, as an Olympic level athlete, that may have been exactly what this athlete needed was a stark departure from, from what mm -hmm. he was doing and came back a little bit stronger too. And if this athlete was pushing the height of his genetic potential, those handful of extra watts could have been mm -hmm. worth all of this. But for everybody else, do recognize that you're just hobbling yourself. And this is an athlete with a, a huge training history. So it's probably not going to apply to you in the same way. Okay. So now let's talk rate of decay and, and this varies across adaptation. So, so back to those uh, Mujica papers in the first three to four weeks, you see these VO2 max and therefore FTP changes that I just talked about, see declines in cardiac output. And if your heart's pushing out less blood, it has to beat more. So heart rate at every level goes up. Blood lactate over the course of just 21 to 28 days changes drastically because you are effectively becoming a more anaerobic athlete as your aerobic capacity dwindles. Muscle glycogen stores decline roughly 20% over a single week of inactivity. And, and I can totally Yowza. attest to this because when I sprained my ankle and I was in a boot for three weeks, I did a couple of booted rides and then I finally did a ride where I took the boot off and I looked down and I was terrified and disgusted all at once. 
Amaret, who was riding next to me on the indoor trainer, looks over at me. And she's like, what? And, and I described it. She's like, can't be that bad. Got off the bike, stood so she could see both my legs side by side. And she actually said, I don't love you as much as I used to. And I know she was kidding. But it was that drastic. It looked, it looked awful. Uh, way to go, Amaret. Oh, that that's atrophy a good one. is so creepy when you see it. It's oh, it's so creepy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's probably uh, the muscles rebounded. So the muscle was probably still there. This was probably just glycogen just gone. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's glycogen synthase. So the, the enzyme responsible for synthesizing gly glycogen decreases after just five days. Those GLUT4 transporters we talked about in the past that push the, the little, the little uh, transporters that move to the outside of the cell to grab the glucose and bring it in, that declines. Your RER, your respiratory exchange ratio, sees a rapid decline over just 14 days. And that means, and, and this is something I think people may not recognize, is that when you go out, you, you, you've had time off, you get on the bike and you go out and you chase some Strava records, as, as Jonathan was describing, and you hit those 30, 40, 60 second efforts and you're flying, maybe even get a couple better times, whatever. Doesn't necessarily mean you're fit because that decrease in aerobic capacity translated to an increase in anaerobic capacity. So now you think you're fit when in fact your aerobic engine is still taking the same hit you cannot avoid. It's yeah, still that, there. That's one of the attacked. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the that's one of the reasons we taper, right, Chad? So uh, yeah, I mean that, yeah. that's one of the reasons. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the takeaway here is that in the first three to four weeks, these are largely central adaptations. They take the biggest hit and that's largely about the heart and the blood, but the peripheral system follows. So your muscles go to your capillary density dwindles, your mitochondrial density and the enzymes that go with it dwindle numerous other oxidative enzymes take a hit early and in most cases continue to decline. And all of this is largely metabolic, but we experience muscle losses as well. Over the course of three to four weeks, you'll get a, a decline in the loss of the maximum force you can put out, the maximum, the maximum power. All these things start to trickle in. And now it's probably like, a good time to mention. <laughs> Amber's oh, sad. I'm sad. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's like you, you neglect your friends and they all go away. <laughs> <laughs> Super good way to put it. That's what happens. They don't want to hang out with you anymore. You're not going to give them attention. I They're know. not going to give you it's the like, benefit bye, of their company. <laughs> <laughs> it was good while it okay. lasted. <laughs> but it's, this is a good time to mention that detraining on newly conditioned versus long-term conditioned, very different effects. So athletes mm -hmm. with a substantial training history detrain to a higher point or a higher VO2 max. And this might be, you know, the semi-permanent we're talking about. So if, for instance, you started training with a 50 VO2 max and with training, you brought it up to a 65, but then you completely detrain, it might only drop to... I don't know, 55 or 54 VO2 max. So you don't lose all of it. Some of it is retained if you really reinforce it. Recently trained, however, expect a return to zero or what's often termed a complete reversal of physiological adaptation. It all goes away. You, you go back to scratch. So do you, and the, I'm going to throw my own question in here if I may. Okay. Do you, do you suggest <laughs> time off for some athletes and not others? Like you seem like the Olympic athlete, right? You were yeah. like those rowers probably needed to reset completely yeah. to build back up higher. Sure. But with a newly trained athlete for their first few years of training, would you suggest like, okay, get like this much under your belt before you start thinking of like time off for physical gains, like mental. As a coach, we'll I, I would, different. because in the early stages, you got to see the longer game, right? And I would just advise against it, or at least try to support the, the consistency and make them completely aware of the fact that this is what's at stake. You can take that time off, but this could reset you. So if you're okay with coming back, basically where you started this time around, no problem, take that time off. But if you wanna hold on to this, you're gonna to have to do a bit of work in the meantime. And that's okay. where cross training can be super valuable too, because it can provide <laughs> get to that. a mental reset without, yep. while you're still stimulating some of these systems. So I'll just interject that a, and back to you, It's Jen. a great point, no, you're exactly <laughs> right. Okay, so this return to zero actually <laughs> carries to other adaptations, it's not your VO2 max. Um, so again, recently trained athletes hear us, hear, hear what we're saying right now. So that's the first four weeks over the next four weeks, everything that I just mentioned, some of it continues to fall. Some of it actually stabilizes. One thing that does enter the mix are the changes in cardiac dimensions. So the, the, both the size of the heart and specifically the size of your left ventricle, the one that fills with the oxygenated, oxygenated blood and pushes it out to your muscles, this increases its wall thickness and also the, the pliability of the, of the tissue itself. 
And both of these things, they, they aid in both letting it fill to a higher extent and clear to a higher extent. So basically you're moving more blood. So this is another decline in that, that central, central, in those central capabilities. And then <clears throat> as far as moderately trained athletes go, if you saw any blood pressure reductions over the course of your training, expect that to be completely reversed at about 12 weeks in. Ventilatory function declines 10 to 14%, your max ventilatory volume. And while we're on the topic really briefly, difference between ventilation and respiration, just wanna spell this out because these terms get used interchangeably and they are not interchangeable. Ventilation is moving air in and out of the lungs. Respiration is the exchange of gases. So oxygen, carbon dioxide. Yes, that takes mm -hmm. place in the lungs. That's pulmonary respiration, but it also takes place in the cells, cellular respiration. So here we're talking about ventilatory function. So ventilatory function. So how much now air you're off and move back you're, out. You're all going to be able to impress your friends at the, well, bars don't happen <laughs> anymore, but at the next zoom call, <laughs> <laughs> the zoom happy hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, capillarization, this is equivocal, so I won't burden you with it, but uh, in recently gained adaptations, there is a return in capillarization or a return to baseline in capillarization. So all those little blood vessels that perfuse your muscle start to dwindle. As far as trained mm -hmm. subjects, it's there's science to support and, and uh, refute that. And then fiber type, fibers A to B, the, the, the conversion happens in runners and cyclists. So you think of the, the slow twitch fibers, they start to become more fast twitch in nature. The cross-sectional area or the muscle mass, and I'm not sure of the time course of this, but those start to dwindle. And then, uh, and, and both these changes are more prominent and recently trained. Again, the, the fitness is simply, the adaptations are simply more brittle. They're more temporary. They're mm. really semi-permanent. Okay, but there is a brighter side here. So first of which, and I struggled and struggled to find this, this paper, but I, I couldn't, and I will continue to look for it because I do want to talk about this, but it suggested that there's a sensitivity to training stress and that detraining can actually increase the sensitivity. So you're to a point, you couldn't elevate past it, but you take some time off and certain things become more sensitive to the training stress when it's reintroduced and you ascend to a higher height. That's cool. Um, and then the, re I think so. That's yeah. Yes. So um, like I said, I'm going to continue to look for that. And if anyone knows that study, please point it out to me. Um, mm -hmm. And then the reductions, as we discussed, or as I discussed above, there is so much evidence that shows your VO2 max doesn't have to take a hit. Your max heart rate won't change at all. Your time to exhaustions at various durations will not change. Your submax uh, VO2 heart rate, your blood lactate levels, all these things can hold really steady if you'll just do a little bit of work and very little is required to, to, to manage this. And as Amber mentioned earlier, we'll close it out, <clears throat> excuse me, with this is that there are tremendous benefits to cross training and it does change across level of athletes, but the, the, the general effects, um, let's see here. So, so when it comes to aerobic maintenance, if you have a lower VO2 max, you can do all sorts of things. Dissimilar modes is, is what it's termed. So you don't necessarily have to be on the bike to maintain bike fitness. You can go do any number of other activities, as long as you're kind of hitting that aerobic engine. If you have a higher VO2 max, however, more similar modes become necessary. So you have to mm -hmm. keep it similar to retain the adaptations in the specific muscles that drive the specific activity you're doing. So I don't think that's news to anybody. Hmm. Um, and then with the higher VO2 max, the, the lower the effect of cross training. So you're probably only gonna be able to get away with it for so long. And then the more elite or the more skilled you are, when it comes to cross training, you face the greater potential for dilution of that skill. So if you're really mm -hmm. good at something, you, you, the more you cross train, the, the more you have at stake. So I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna recap based on all that awesome information that you just provided, Chad. Thanks, I was Forgive watching me. the clock the whole time. It's <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, that's good. It. Um, Nailed it. Uh, so basically, is there any science behind the claim that fitness comes back quickly? And we've covered decay rates and that it drops. And as far as coming back quickly, quickly, we've actually covered this before on a podcast episode. And if you search for base that very much that, that very thing, fitness coming back, you'll be able to find it with Ask a Cycling Coach podcast where we covered that. Um, but yeah, uh, to, his, to his original question here, we have all those things that end up coming, going down. It does not take much to be able to maintain them, as Chad said, and it also doesn't take much to be able to come back from them. Uh, but it is important in that process to understand what is lost. Um, you can't just all chalk it up to bro science and hope. So <laughs> one, one 
positive silver lining of all of this is reading through all of this. These are all of the amazing things that happen when you do train. And mm-hmm, I think sometimes mm-hmm. people look at say a VO2 max test, for example, and they're like, Oh, that's my number. But these things are plastic. They change, which means yes, they can come down, but they can go back up again. So it's pretty cool mm-hmm. when you look at these lists of things that we see happen and diminish with detraining, but it's like, these are the things that are happening positively every time you ride your bike, which is pretty cool. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.